If I had a nickel for every car of coal that ran on U.S. railroads in 1991, well, to be exact, I'd have $324,000. $595.50. Of course, the complexities of managing almost six and a half million nickels might be more than you or I could easily handle, but for American railroads and our coal industry in general, that simply means that together they'd need to load more than 20,000 cars of coal each typical workday. That's 20,000 cars a day. Likewise, they'd weigh 20,000 loaded cars a day. They'd dispatch 20,000 loaded hoppers in various trains bound for market each day. And they'd dump 20,000 coal cars daily at ocean piers, steam electric generation plants, and at the docks of a variety of other coal users. While we haven't even begun to talk about the empties, there's no question that our coal industry is one incredible operation. From the simple tipple in a hidden hollow to the massive flood loaders that rapidly fill unit coal trains, our country's coal system accounts for more than three out of every ten U.S. rail car loads and perhaps half of the tonnage. The numbers are plainly staggering. The Swiss cheese beneath Virginia, Kentucky, and West Virginia must be an incredible maze of abandoned tubes and shafts. And yet this stupendous harvesting of one of Mother Nature's oldest creations goes on unabated day after day after day. We've been harvesting coal for more than a hundred years and probably will still be digging for coal in the 22nd century and beyond. For now though, we're not going back to the future or even the past. We're going to take a look at coal operations in the early 1990s as we take our cameras up to the coal fields of Virginia's Baby and then down to Central Florida to visit a Florida electric power plant. This is all CSX territory and we'll watch this mega railroad as it tirelessly runs coal from mine to market just like it does every day over and over again. The northern end of the old Clinchfield Railroad is a great region in which to begin our study of the coal process. The glut of abandoned tipples and mines that dot the CSX main line are in stark contrast to the active plants and future coal plans that add stability to the region and continue the coal legacy that established Dickinson County. As the turn of the century, CCNO strove to provide a rail corridor that would connect Southern Ocean Harbors with the Ohio River and industrial centers beyond, the Clinchfield's famous short route legend just happened to traverse through the hearts of several very rich coal seams and practically assured the railroad and its successors of financial prosperity for the next 100 and probably 200 years. We'll take a close look at this coal country, and as soon as we get a few hoppers loaded, we'll head off to Florida in search of the EF unit coal trains. Often unloading two full coal trains each day, our Central Florida Electric Generation Plant operates four separate coal to steam generators and has a rather obvious, voracious appetite for fresh black diamonds that requires a constant high volume flow of coal. These EF trains average two loads and two empty trains per day on the old Clinchfield lines and are easily recognized by the V-shaped EF graphic, the symbol of electric fuels of Florida. If you saw our first Clinchfield video, it won't surprise you that we'll begin our coal story at Dant, Virginia, the heart and soul of Clinchfield Railroad coal operations. Like most other railroad appendages, Dant has undergone considerable changes. While it no longer weighs or classifies loaded hoppers and mine runs are considerably reduced, Dant still calls the shots for virtually all of CSX's Dickinson County coal operations. Years ago, this was the track used both for weighing each hopper on the scales beside the operation shack and for classifying each car as it gravity rolled on south into the yard. Today, things are turned around a bit as departing coal jobs pull their empties from the old loads yard on the south end, out the old scale track and classification track, and then on to the mines.
even one engineer told me that here at Nice Creek, with such steep grades, even the simplest switching moves often turn into short-term runaways. Regardless of initial source, raw coal generally is loaded with unacceptable materials that must be filtered out. The rocks and other waste then become part of another interesting aspect of the coal process, namely the building of new mountains with coal refuse. Here at McClure, it's been going on so long, it's hard to tell the real mountains from all but the very newest waste mountains. The man-made hills grow fast because as much as half of the contents of a 100-ton hopper of raw coal might be rock. Not only does that make the new hills grow fast, but it also means that while a 100-ton hopper might carry 100 tons of clean coal, the same size load of raw coal, including the denser rocks, might weigh as much as 150 tons. We'll talk more about these gob piles and slate dumps when we get to Hayside. That's what? Slate. So that's not coal, huh? No, that's what they take out of the coal, the dirt and the rock. Okay, okay, that's enough time freight. Back to coal. <laughs> Remember back at Wakemvi, we told you we'd get to see a job where the pusher does all the work? Well, here at the Fremont River Dock, when the train is northbound, the head engines just cut loose and sit by as the pusher handles just about everything. We'll take a brief look at this operation and then quickly be on our way. In a nutshell, there are two loaded hoppers to extract from the yard today, and also they'll drop off a few additional empties. When we're done here, we'll speed on over to Hayside. This is the tipple at Crooked Branch, and its conveyors bring coal over Highway 83 and Prater Creek for loading. Notice the flood loading spout. Crooked Branch has often loaded over 100 cars per day, which, of course, go direct to McClure for cleaning. Like many other loaders, a winch supplies the uphill power, Gravity brings cars down, and brake riders make sure the cars stop in all the right places. The first coal mines opened by the Clinchfield Coal Company were in 1906 at Dant and Crane's Nest. Corporate offices were moved to Dant in 1912, and though the mine closed in 1959, Clinchfield Coal still operates out of Dant, though the company conducts most of its business a few miles over in Lebanon and is now a division of the Pittston Company. Our train is nearing the end of the Hayside branch as it approaches the Greenbrier Tipple. 
Coal loaded here is conveyed from the Hagee Seam on Greenbrier Creek to this unusually well-kept plant. It will be getting dark soon, and this job is about done for the day. Most of its Dant and McClure-bound traffic is waiting back at Ruth's siding, and the train first will make a few pickups at the Greenbrier Tipple before heading home. Yes, of course, this is where the Greenbrier Turn gets its name. But the most important thing about where we are is that we're only a half mile from where Clinchfield Coal parks the famous Hayside Number 1.